you may know, but you may not. We have many men in our ministry here who serve with the Gideons. It is a very worthwhile ministry. If you're interested in getting more information, I'm sure we've got some people who would love to help you get connected with the Gideon ministry. All right. Have you ever noticed that sometimes a little bit of knowledge changes everything? Any of you grow up uh, watching G.I. Joe? All right, some of you, you're laughing, I know you have. Remember, G.I. Joe always ended with some moral lesson, and one of the Joes would tell the moral lesson, the kid would say something like, and now I know. And what was the response? And knowing is half the battle. I'm going to say this, sometimes knowing is more than half the battle. Sometimes knowing actually changes everything. For years and years, I didn't ride roller coasters. You know why? I know about gravity. <laughs> we aren't meant to go upside down, right? But you know, sometimes I ride roller coasters at some of the big theme parks. You know why? Because I know how strenuously they're tested. I know that they, uh, the, you know, all the belts are just perfectly designed. They test them every day. They have to send people through them before they can let the public on them each day. I don't want that job. What I don't do is I don't ride roller coasters at the county fair because those were set up last night. I'm not doing that. Knowledge changes things a little bit. And sometimes there are things of knowledge that we need to know, we need to get our heads around. And, and if we don't know the right things, we behave the wrong way, right? So we have road signs. The road signs tell us, hey, the, ro the road is curvy up ahead. And so you know you got to tap the brakes a little bit, unless you're one of those people who just thinks it's great to just power curve. Okay? Yeah, some of you are looking at yourselves. That's great. I'm not riding with you. I know that now. All right. So what we're going to look at today, we're going to look at a passage where Paul is talking to the Ephesians, and it's in, it's in my favorite chapter of the Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 is amazing because Paul lays out all these amazing truths about what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, all the blessings of God for believers in Jesus Christ. And I'll be honest with you, we were just, uh, Josh mentioned our small groups, our small groups are going through Ephesians, and as we were going through this passage a couple weeks ago, I thought, I need to go back and look at that passage some more. And so I'll make another plug real quick. Get involved in one of these small groups. It's a great opportunity to really dive into the Word. But as we're looking at Ephesians chapter 1, we get to a point in Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul starts to pray for the Ephesian church, and by extension, he's praying for all of us. And so if you're in Ephesians 1, look at Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 15. Paul says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at, the right, at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Paul is praying for the Ephesians, and he says to him, you know what, listen, I want you to get your head around a couple of things. There are a couple of things I want you to know, and I want you to see what he prays for them. He prays that they would know three things. The first, he says, I pray that you would know the hope to which you are called. He says to the saints, he says, listen, what I want you to get, what I want you to wrap your head around is this. I want you to understand what the hope is you're called to, what your future is, what I have in store for you. Now, listen, we see the word hope here, 
And when I say I hope so, let's be honest, man. If you invite me somewhere and I say I, I hope to come, what I'm really saying, I'm not coming. Probably not. But the very best in our language when we say we hope so, what we're saying is, man, I hope it works out. I'm a little bit fearful, but I, I kind of hope it'll work out. First thing I want you to understand is when Paul uses the word hope here, it doesn't mean hope like we use hope. What it actually means is assurance. It actually means something that is guaranteed to happen. Because I want you to understand the hope you're called to is, a, is an assurance of what's coming before you. Let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm a, I'm a big sports fan. I, in that, I love to watch sports on TV, and I only... I, it's not even true. I only like to watch North Carolina basketball. Any, any Carolina fans here? Okay. Yeah, my son's cheering. We'll pray for the rest of you. Um, I'm not a fun guy to watch Carolina basketball with, though. I'll tell you why. I get worked up. I, I no longer throw things. My wife has worked on me. But I get worked up, and I get stressed. And I've watched every great game Carolina's had for the last 30 years and I didn't enjoy any of them. Because throughout the whole game, I was stressing about what's going to happen next. And then this past week, I had something interesting happen. If you're a basketball fan, Carolina was in the Final Four this year. I was so sure they were going to lose that I didn't watch the game. But you know what I did last week? I watched the YouTube of the last three minutes. And if you guys don't know, if you're not a basketball fan, I'm sorry. Carolina beat Duke. Awesome. Always great to beat Duke. Beat Duke in Coach K's last game. Totally awesome. But the last three minutes was nail-biting time. You know, tight, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I'm watching the replay of the game. I'm like, oh, my gosh, they took the lead. Oh, my goodness, we took the lead. And I thought, wait a second, I know how this ends. There's no stress here. We're going to win. And then when I, when I watched the other team take the lead, I'm like, <laughs> whatever, you guys celebrate now. We're going to win in the end. Why do I share that? Mainly to rub it into the Duke fans. But also... To say this, this is what our eternity looks like. We know what's coming, right? We know the future. It's an assured hope. We are guaranteed that certain things are going to happen. And Paul says, I want you to wrap your head around this hope, because when you wrap your head around that hope, it changes everything. Let's think about what we have as a hope. We have a hope, meaning an assured conviction, that we are going to see Jesus face to face. Paul tells us someday, we're, now we see like through a glass, but someday we're going to see him face to face. And you know what else? The other assured hope we have is when we see him face to face, we're going to be like him. Our future is we're going to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. We have this hope that we're going to be like him. We have a hope of eternal life. Someday, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to see him face to face, and you're going to be with him forever. And that life is going to be eternal, and it's never going to go away, and it's going to be awesome, and all the pain and all the suffering of this world are going to be gone. Paul says, I want you to get that hope in your head. I want you to know that this is your future, because have you ever noticed that when you know what's going to happen next, it changes the way you handle things that are happening right now? Paul says, get in your head. You have this amazing hope. You're going to see Jesus. You're going to be with him for all eternity. You're going to live in eternal victory. And you know what? If you get that right, the setbacks of today aren't quite so hard to handle. The trials of today are easier to manage when we know that eternal victory is our future. Now listen, let me make this real clear. I'm not saying things are going to be easy in this world. That was never a promise of Jesus Christ. But the promise we do have is all the trials of this world don't measure up to the victory that we're going to have in the next. So Paul says, I want you to get your head around this hope. I want you to see this hope that's coming for you. And I want you to live instead of in dread and live instead of, instead of living beaten down and feeling, feeling beat up all the time, live in the hope that someday we're going to be with Jesus. And watch how that radically changes everything. The other thing is this. He says, I wish that you would know the riches of his inheritance in the saints. All right, earlier in Ephesians 1, Paul talks about our inheritance. He says, you know, because we're believers of Jesus Christ, we're going to receive an inheritance, which means that we're going to spend eternity in the kingdom of heaven with our Father. That's our inheritance. But here in this passage, Paul actually says, I want you to understand the, the riches of 
God's inheritance in the saints. This isn't what we're going to receive. This is what God's going to receive. And I thought J.D. Greer did a great job of explaining this. He said, listen, this is the thing that God didn't have before the cross that he has after the cross. So what's the inheritance of God? The saints. What's the inheritance of God? What's the thing that God values above all else? You. The God of the universe values us so much that he took on flesh, came and dwelt among us, laid down his life on our behalf, raised again, and now is waiting for us. Jesus is preparing a place for us. And what, what Paul wants us to get, around, get our head around here is this. He wants us to wrap our heads around how much God loves us. And not only how much God loved us in that he saved us, but how much God loves us in that he's looking forward to the day that we'll be united with him. You know, we don't often think about that, right? We think about the fact, hey, I'm looking forward to heaven. You know, God's looking forward to us being there too. God loves you so much that he wants to have you with him for all eternity. So God, Paul says here, listen, the first two things I want you to wrap your head around, and we're skimming over these because I want to get to the, to the third one. That's where we're going to really, really uh, drill down. He wants you to understand what our future is, that our future is amazing, it's unchangeable, we're going to be there. <laughs> this is the amazing thing to do. Heaven doesn't depend on me. God's grace has already saved me. He's already punched my ticket. I'm getting there no matter what I do because of the grace of God. And then on top of that, God's, God's waiting. He loves you. He wants you. He values you. He's looking forward to this moment. But then the last thing he wants us to know is this. I want you to look at in, in this passage. He says, I want you to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. Paul says, I want you to know your future. I want you to know how much God loves and values you. But the last thing I want you to get your head around is the power of God working towards us. We talk about sometimes, as I mentioned before, sometimes just getting knowledge changes the way everything else looks. Getting knowledge changes all your behavior. Paul says, I want you to drill down and really understand the power of God. And not only just the power of God, this is not a theoretical power of God. He says, I want you to understand the power of God doing what? Working towards you. It's this idea that the power of God is working in, through us, and on our behalf. And then Paul, Paul spends the rest of this prayer really breaking down what this power is all about. And I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this and talking about this. He says, listen. He says, and I want you to understand the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. I want you to notice first off, how does Paul describe the power of God working towards us? He says, I want you to understand the immeasurable power. I don't know about you guys, all right? When somebody tells me something's too big to measure, you know what I don't do? I don't try to measure it. Um, I don't go get my tape measure. But what Paul is saying here is, the first thing he wants you to understand is, listen, God's might working on your behalf is immeasurable. It's surpassing. It's above anything else. Matter of fact, the Greek, there are three words that go bang, 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 but it's the mega surpassing dynamite power of God working on your behalf. I want you to understand this is a power bigger than you can ever get your head around. That's the power of God working on your behalf. Now listen, here's the thing. Paul says it's immeasurable. He says, I can't quantify it for you. And we need to understand that we will never on this side of heaven fully understand the power of God working on our behalf. But I do think this. While we can't measure it, I think we do need to try to get our head around a little bit. Because you know what Paul does after he says it's immeasurable? He then spends the next several verses describing it to us so that we can get our head around how powerful the work of God, how, power, how much the power of God is that's working on our behalf. And I want you to see how he explains it. He says it's immeasurable. But then he says it's the power 
that raised Jesus from the dead. Let that sink in for a second. I don't, how many of you have gone to a funeral? How many of you had anybody get out of the casket? I actually have an agreement. If I'm coming to a funeral, you stay. <laughs> you know, though, think about it. Death is the bully on the block, right? Death was undefeated. There's a ratio that is almost always true. One person, one death. Except for in rare cases where you know what what happens with death then? Death comes into contact with the power of God. And only when death comes into contact with the power of God is death defeated. Other than that, death is undefeated. One of my favorite expressions is father time is undefeated. Take it a step further. The grim reaper is undefeated in its battles against humans. Only when the power of God is involved is death ever defeated. And what what Paul says is this. The most amazing event in history, the most incredible event in history was the day that Jesus Christ got out of the grave. Not only because of the fact that it defeated death, but because it changed everything. When, When Jesus Christ got out of the grave, the laws of nature were turned on their heads, right? When Jesus Christ got out of the grave, Satan was defeated. He was beaten. I love the line in the song we sang earlier, death could not hold you down. Do you not think Satan was trying to keep Jesus in the grave? All the powers of evil were trying to keep Jesus in the grave, and they couldn't. You know why? Because the power of God is stronger than death. When, When Jesus raised from the dead... He turned the world upside down. He had it, he he broke everything in Satan's kingdom that day. He restored life where there had been death. And what's amazing is, I know some of you are thinking, well, Jack, there have been other people raised from the dead. Yeah, all the other people were raised from the dead by somebody else. You know, in the Old Testament, Samuel raised people from the dead. In the New Testament, Jesus raised people from the dead. Jesus is the only person who raised himself from the dead. That's power. And here's what Paul says, says, that's the power working on your behalf. The power that turns the world upside down. The power that changes the laws of nature. And what what God really said at the moment where he, he raised Jesus from the dead is, listen, I made the laws of nature. I made the rules. And I can break the rules. And I can change the rules because I'm that powerful. And Paul says, I want you to understand something. That's the power that's working on your behalf. It's the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And it's, it's interesting here, the, the Greek word, and I meant to mention this before, the Greek word that's translated here as power is the word dunamos. Sounds a little bit like Dynamite. Because that's the root word that Alfred Noble used when he, when he invented dynamite. He said, well, I'm looking for something that describes explosive power. And he went to this Greek term. And God's saying, there's an explosive potential power working on your behalf that can turn everything upside down. Now, here's the thing. We often think, well, you know, I'm powerless. I'm small. I'm little. You know, I can't get the president on the phone. I can't even get my congressman on the phone. What if... And God says, listen, don't worry about all that. That's earthly power. Understand this. The power of God is working on your behalf. And the power is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. In Colossians 2.15, we're told what happened when that power operated. It says, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him power that raised Jesus from the dead, like I said, it turns Satan's kingdom upside down. And there's this, there's this picture here, not only that Satan's kingdom is conquered, Satan's kingdom is destroyed, the power of death is destroyed, there's this picture of taunting. So he made a triumph over him. He made fools over the enemy. It's interesting when you think about it, we often fear the devil, we fear Satan, and we, we need to show respect to our adversary. But understand something, the power of the one who's working on our behalf has already defeated him, has already triumphed over him. 
So it's the power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's immeasurable. It's the power that raised Jesus from the dead. But the next thing is that he used to describe it as it's the power that seated Jesus at the right hand of the Father. See, and this is a, this is a picture here. But listen, Jesus was in the grave. He was dead. In theory, all hope was lost. But the power of God said, no. I'm going to conquer death. I'm going to destroy death. I'm going to destroy the kingdom of Satan. And not only that, I'm going to take my son who's in the grave and I'm going to elevate him to the right hand of the Father. That's a turnaround, isn't it? Think about it. Satan's kingdom thought they had victory and instead in the moment, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. This is what the power is of God. It's the power to defeat death. It's the power to place Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And not only is he placed at the right hand of the Father, what we're told here is that he still has that power. Look back in our passage. It says here, and that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So listen, here's the power of God. The power of God raised Jesus from the dead, placed him in the heavenlies beside the Father, and now Jesus is above every name and above every power, and above every dominion. And here's the idea. Jesus is in charge. What's he in charge of? Everything. And Paul says, I want you to understand something. The power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that placed Jesus at the right hand of the Father, the power that Jesus exercises today as the head above all things is working towards you. I want you to understand the power of God working towards you. I want you to understand what God is doing on your behalf and for you. He says he made Christ the head of the church. And so everything is working according to the power of God for the church. Now, I'm not talking... Let me just pause here. Let me just say this. A couple times, sometimes we get this passage and we say, well, look, look at all this stuff that God is doing for me. Or look at all the power that I have as a believer in Jesus Christ. That's not what this passage means. It's not about you getting more power or you getting more authority or even it's not about you being able to exercise great power. What it's about is this. God is saying, listen, all my power is being exercised to work in you what I want to work in you. All my power is being exercised towards you in order to make sure that the purposes I have for you are fulfilled. And what that should do to us is it should open our minds and understand something. We are not victims. We have nothing to fear in this world. Why? Because the surpassing power of God is working towards us for his glory. God's power is beyond anything we can get our heads around, beyond anything we can understand. And he says, all of it's being worked towards you. So let's think about what that means for us. It's one thing to have somebody, I don't know about you guys, I'm sure I can express this. It's one thing to have somebody who wants the best for you. It's something entirely to have somebody who wants the best for you and can make it happen, right? You guys ever have someone who was helping you? And they wanted to help you, but they just weren't able to. And you say, well, that's great. I'm glad you love me, but you can't really help me. Or have you ever had someone who says, you know what? I love you. I want to help you. And I actually have the authority to do it. That's what we have in our Father. He says, you know what? I love you. I want the best for you. I have a plan for you. I'm going to use you for my glory. And not only that, I have the power to make sure all this happens. And so when we understand that the power of God is working towards us, there are a couple of things that we need to, that will, should change in our, in our thinking. First is this. First thing this means to me is I'm secure in Christ. One of my favorite verses is John 10, 28 and 29. If you're familiar with that verse, it's Jesus is talking to his disciples. 
and he says, I hold all my sheep in my hand. And my father holds them in his hand. And there's nothing that has the power, there's no one who has the power to pluck them out of my hand. Remember before we said our hope is something that's assured? You know why our hope is assured? Because the power of God is assuring it. As you know what, I've called you to myself. I promise you heaven, and there's nothing on this earth or anywhere else that's going to take this away from you. I'm holding you in my hands. I'm secure. Romans 8, I'm going to turn over to Romans 8. There's some, some neat stuff there. But in Romans 8, 38 and 39, talking about security in Christ, we need to understand that no one can snatch us from God, and nothing can separate you from God's love. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because the power of God is working on your behalf, there's nothing that can separate you from God. Every once in a while, Satan wants to get in your ear and say, oh, you know what? You're separated from God. You know, you're drifting from God. You know, you know you and God's not listening to you anymore. And instead, Paul says, no, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know why? Because the power of God says no. As a matter of fact, further down in that passage, uh, in Romans 8, I'm sorry, further up in that passage, Romans 8, 33 and 34, not only can we not be separated from God, understand, no one can even bring a charge against God's elect. Paul says in Romans 8, 33, says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Paul gives us a picture. Listen, nothing's going to separate you from God. Satan's going to come in. He's going to make attacks against you. He's going to try to make claims against you. He's going to accuse you before God. And you know what God is going to say? He says, sit down. I don't want to hear from you. My power is holding them. My power is keeping them. So we as believers know that we're secure, that our heavenly, uh, our heavenly future is guaranteed because of the power of God. Also means this, it means that our purposes are going to be, God's purpose for us is going to be fulfilled. What is God's purpose for us? We spend a lot of time talking about God's purpose, and God has individual purposes for us, but you know there are a couple of general purposes that we all have. You know God promises he's going to do for each and every one of us as we follow him. He's going to make us more like Jesus. And you know what? You know why he's going to make us more like Jesus? Because his power has declared it. Nothing's going to stop him from making us into what, we want, when, into what he wants us to become. His power guarantees that we'll be made like him. His power guarantees that he's going to call you to himself. Someday the trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise first and those who are alive and remain will be gathered up with him and we're going to be with, heaven for, with him in heaven for all eternity and nothing can stop that because his power is working towards you. His purposes are going to be fulfilled in you. Now, what is our role? We have to obey. We have to follow. But understand it's God's power that helps us to obey and to follow. Jesus, our, our, our Savior, is above all, as in charge of all. Think about this also. Not only is God's purpose going to be fulfilled, but every one of God's promises is going to be fulfilled. You guys ever read through God's promises and claim them and hold on to them? Often we read the promises and we just kind of gloss over and say, oh, that's awesome. It's so nice that God promised. We think that God promises like we promise. You know, if I promise to be there, I'm hoping to be there but I may not be. When God makes a promise, his power guarantees that promise. So when he promises that he's going to work all things together for good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, he's going to do it. When he promises, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you, he's going to do it. You know why? Because nobody can move him. Nobody can take him away from you. Nobody can separate you from him because his power is working towards you. In his power, all our hopes are fulfilled. In his power, all his promises will be fulfilled. And because of his power, we can trust his promises. Here's the last thing. 
because of the God's power working towards us, we are equipped to do anything he's called us to do. Philippians 4.13 tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As a kid, I thought that that meant that I'd play in the NBA. That's not. God said, I did not equip you for that. Um, that wasn't your calling. But the things that I've called you for, you can do. The things that I plan for you, you will do. Because you can do all things through the strength of Christ. Um, and if we roll back and we think about that, this is really key. This is really important. What this means is this. If God calls you to minister for him, you can do it. You ever feel like God's calling you to do something? Say, well, Lord, I'm, I'm not really equipped for that. Let me tell you a funny story. I was 17 at Brethren National Youth Conference, now Momentum, when I felt the Lord call me to ministry. I said, Lord, I can't do that. I hate public speaking. He said, don't worry. I'll take care of it. But I, I don't do that. And actually, it was a, it's an interesting thing because I had this whole list of excuses as to why I couldn't do what God was calling me to do. And a friend of mine made a list of my gifts, and they lined up exactly in opposite to what I thought I didn't have for ministry. And God said, I prepared you, I'm going to equip you, and I'm going to use you because it's not about you, it's about me. It's about my power working through you and towards you. So if God calls you for something, don't get caught up on what you think you can do and can't do. Instead, understand the power of God is working towards you for the ministry that he's called you to. How about this? I don't want you all to raise your hands on this one. I want you to think about it. You have some, something in your life, a besetting sin, something that keeps messing you up. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's an action. Something that you know that is keeping you from doing the things that God's called you to do. The power of God working towards you is enough to overcome that. Whatever bondage you're in, God's power is strong enough to break that bondage. Whatever habit you just can't seem to break, God's power is strong enough to break that habit. Whatever attitude in your heart that's not Christ-like, God's power is enough to change that attitude and make you more like Christ. The awesome thing is wherever we're at right now, we feel like we're being beat up and we're being, we're being held down. God says, I've already got that covered. My power is enough. My grace is sufficient to make you who I want you to be. See, here's the thing. Unlimited power is working towards us. The power of God is working towards us. That's why Paul says in Romans 8 that in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There's nothing that can stop us from doing the things that God's called us to do. So what do we have to do? We understand, so like I said at the beginning, sometimes knowing is enough to change everything. Well, knowing that God's power is working on your behalf, what should that do for us? What should we do in response to that knowledge? There are a couple of things I want, us, I want you to think about. I committed myself this week to just stepping back and being amazed by the power of God. Because you know what? I can't get my head around it. I can't understand it. It's immeasurable, remember? But I can't be amazed by it. And I encourage you to take some time to be amazed by what God wants to do towards you through his power. The other thing I want you to do is this. Rest in God's power towards you. What I mean by that is this. We keep thinking that everything depends on us. That we're always striving. We're always trying to do something more. We're always trying to make a way. God says, listen, my power is working towards you. What I want you to do is to rest in my power. Trust in my power. Believe that I'm doing this thing for you. And then you just obey. The final thing is this. Stop living in your own power and start living in God's. I told you before, you might have a, a spot of bondage in your life. You can't break that bondage. Stop trying to do it yourself and start letting God's power break it for you. You can't make yourself more like Jesus, but God will do it for you if you'll live in his power. 
If instead of saying it's all about me, instead, instead of realizing it's all about him, God will make a difference. God will make a change. Here's the thing. The greatest power in the universe is working towards us for his glory. Often I think that we try to get in the way by doing our own thing. When what we really need to do is just sit back and let God do the work in us. That means that we have to be in, in relationship with him. We have to be seeking him. We have to be loving him. So it's not, it's not totally passive. But it's working towards him in a way that allows his work to work in us. Rather than trying to do it ourselves, realizing his power is what's really going to make a change in our lives. And you know what? When it starts making the changes, it's going to be amazing changes. Because his power is immeasurable. It's more than you can ever imagine. And he loves you so much, he's working it towards you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the amazing power of God working towards us who believe. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to save ourselves. We just have to accept the gift that's been given to us. We thank you, Lord, that as we walk with you, you do a work in us. We ask, Lord, you help us to get out of the way of your work and allow your work to really move through us. We thank you, Lord, that your love is so great that you've taken the power that raised Jesus from the dead and you work it towards us. We thank you so much, Lord, that Jesus now stands above every name and every power. And he's ordaining and he's working on our behalf. We ask, Lord, that you help us to not live in fear. Lord, we ask you help us not to live as victims. But help us, Lord, to live in victory, knowing that everything's been handled by your power and will be handled by your power. Lord, help us to walk with you so we can see your victory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.